and welcome to True Sports. I'm your host, Kirk Stevens. Today we have two interesting stories about great athletes who have overcome adversity to become one of the best in their sport. And later, we'll have an interview with clinical psychologist, Dr. Michael D. Smith, who will help us to understand what makes these athletes triumph in spite of the obstacles they face. Producer Zarai Perez brings us this story about an amazing cyclist. himself, yet with every step he defied the odds and wound up on top. I've won three gold medals, three national championships on the track. And when it comes to road racing, I've taken home silver or bronze. There's a number of things that I like when I'm competing. Is that feeling of, of going fast, that excitement level, that enthusiasm, that adrenaline. It's like being in the zone. Before I started racing bikes, I was racing stock outboard hydroplane boats. It was a fast and exciting sport. My first couple years, though, it was, it was a big challenge. I was constantly flipping my boat and wasn't really getting anywhere. And a couple years later, I won the first five races. I remember the first time I... I went to see him race, and I said to him, Kevin, you could get killed doing this. Oh, Mom, I could get killed walking across the street. I'll be fine. Tires on the outside, flat out and flying, gaining on waters as they come out of corner number one. in the yard. Scott, you all right? And he asked for me, and I thought, oh my goodness, this is not something I'm going to want to hear. It was gruesome and gory, but I don't know, I did, didn't panic. I wanted to make sure that she didn't drown because it was in the water. It was in this faithful race in 1987 that Kevin caught a huge wake caused by a pleasure boat pulling a skier. This caused him to fly into the water when another hydroplane hit him in the head. Kevin received the devastating news that he will never see again. I blame myself. Because I always would think, why? Why didn't I hang under my boat? Why did I let myself get tossed from it? I think I really learned about how much shame I was putting on myself of thinking I was the one that could have stopped that accident from happening. As a child, Kevin was full of the Dickens all the time. <laughs> he was always very protective of his sisters, but he really likes to needle us. Like he would always tease us and pick on us, joke around, you know, that kind of thing. He had a lot of friends and I think being the only boy, I think it was probably hard for him to relate to three sisters sometimes. So he was, you know, usually off doing things with his friends, but he's a great brother. Well, I first met Kevin in the summer of 1984. Um, so that makes it 31 years now. He was known as Scott Man. To be totally honest, he was a, a ladies man. He won't admit it, but we all envied him a little bit. 
I think there's been a real evolution over the years since the accident. So the biggest thing is really just that, that being so goal oriented, you know, seeing the next goal in front of him and then going after that and achieving that and then taking that next step, you know, from, from just having to recreate his life and figure out how to get out of bed and take a shower and shave to what am I going to do with the rest of my life. It's just, it's amazing to me how he just keeps pushing himself and, and reaching further for that new goal. And then along the way, I think developing some, some skills and some confidence that wasn't there before. So, you know, becoming more confident in who he is and in, in his ability to reach those goals. In 2008, while recovering from a broken ankle caused by a skiing accident, Kevin came across information about a tandem development camp sponsored by the USABA. It was at this camp that he was inspired to become a stoker and race tandems competitively. I, mean, I was lucky to be introduced to Bob as my track pilot because he's, he's been doing it for 20 some years and he's really good at it and he can provide a lot of wisdom to me and ways that I can improve to be a better bike racer. And it's been really excellent to race with Bob. Yeah, we've won quite a few medals, I have to say, and done fairly well, especially when we're competing against individuals that are quite a bit younger. Me and my pilot have won three gold medals, three national championships on the track. And when it comes to road racing, the only medals I've ever taken home is silver or bronze. Kevin is a part of an unstoppable team. It truly is amazing to see how far he's come since that fateful day in 1987. Most of the time I use a, a one-up bike here at home. I have to pull up on a lever on the back side here, which pushes a roller up against the rear tire, and that puts tension on it. So what I did is I had a friend make me this device, which has got a wood floor over the rollers, and the bike can still reach the rollers, and then there's a wall on either side. And when I first started using these rollers, I would drift quite a bit from side to side. And if I didn't have the walls there, I would definitely go off the rollers and crash. Our racing season's eight months, so it's, it's a long season. Uh, there is a break in between. I personally with myself do about eight races. And in 2012, this very same hard work and determination allowed Kevin his first two gold medals at the National Championships in Carson, California. In 1995, Kevin graduated with honors from MSOE with a bachelor's in computer science. He continues to ski, canoe, parasail, and much more. In 2013, he participated in the American Lung Association's Fight for Air Climb, ascending 47 flights of stairs, and took ninth place out of 2,600 participants. I had to be out there because I had to prove something. I had to prove who I was. And I thought racing was going to do it. I think that can help other people.
by seeing what I've done, they can realize that their ability to overcome a change starts right here, right inside of them. And we all have that, and we don't know that we have it. That was a truly fascinating story. If you would like to learn more about Kevin, you can visit his website at www.mytruevision.com. We now take a look at the next story featuring Becca Murray, a great basketball player whose dream was to be a part of Team USA. August 2015, Becca Murray was the overall leading scorer to help her team take home yet another gold medal. This helped solidify Team USA a ticket to the 2016 Rio de Janeiro Games. Um, I've enjoyed watching and playing uh, any sport really uh, since I was really young. Becca is somewhat of a celebrity in the basketball world. Although quiet and gentle in spirit, she is a fierce competitor on the court. I have won uh, about six gold medals. Although a highly decorated athlete and one of the best on her team, there's something we forgot to mention. I was born with spina bifida. Spina bifida is a type of birth defect called neural tube defect. It occurs when the bones of the spine don't form properly around part of the baby's spinal cord. In my instance, I can move and feel my legs, but that's not the instant for everybody. Some people have more effect and then other people have less, so it varies quite a bit. I found out that Becca was going to have spina bifida about in my um, third month. It was very scary. I actually knew nothing about spina bifida. Regardless of her impairment, Becca never allowed this to make her feel any different. Growing up, I would say that I felt like I fit in. I had a great support system around me that didn't really let me um, pity myself or you know, make excuses just because I had a disability. They wanted me to be determined. All her friends were doing it at the time and being in a chair, it was gonna be harder. I wanted to be a part of a sports team. Baseball, ice hockey, street hockey, I mean, as rough as it gets for any other kids, it was just as rough for them. I love playing basketball and it kind of takes away everything else. Like, you know, when you're on the court, all you have to worry about is basketball in that game. You don't have to worry about anything else that's going on in life. It's just having fun. Becca loved basketball so much that in 2005, and at the tender age of 14, she decided to try out for Team USA. Although denied twice, it was in 2007. Her dream finally came true. I felt like it was going to happen, you know, eventually, but I wasn't quite sure when. At that time, I was the youngest to ever make the team. It was pretty awesome to hear my name get called. Yeah, it was pretty nerve wracking. I mean, you put her on a plane and you just wait. You know, and then you get that phone call saying I made it. I enjoyed learning from the veterans of that team when I was younger as well. Besides Team USA, Becca also plays for the women's Bucks team and played for UW Whitewater, where she won a national championship in 2013 and Player of the Year twice. As a teammate, she's um, understanding and she's like, She's fun to work with in that she congratulates you on everything. She talks to you on the court. She helps you do things that you've always wanted to do as a player. She's really fun to work with. 
In 2008, a year after she became part of Team USA, Becca Murray became a Paralympian and took home the gold. Just a very proud moment. She had a police escort from the entrance of the subdivision and the neighbors were all in the streets and it was amazing. And in 2010 was the World Championships, which were in England. I think that was the year that I really showed what I had. There was a championship game against Germany where we just kept going back and forth, back and forth. Like we had so many lead changes that game. And at the end, um, it was me and my other teammate that were on one side and they double jumped her and just kind of left me open. Uh, and there was only like seconds left on the clock and she just dumped me the ball and I made my layup, which put us up basically to win the game. I thought it was amazing, but I didn't expect anything less. <laughs> it's Becca. She makes almost all her shots. And 2012 is special to me, even though we took fourth at the London Paralympics because all of the players basically retired after 2008-ish. So it was a new team in 2012. Um, just building together and I'm now the veteran players. After making the team this many times, I didn't know how it would feel that we're all trying to take this in because this may be it. And I said to her when she came home, I'm just as proud as it was the first time you made this team. Well, I still get nervous to this day when they call the names. You never know if you're part of what they're looking for. You know, they could decide that they want to go a different way. In true Paralympian fashion, Becca helped her team go undefeated to win the 2015 Parapan American Games. A top scorer, she averaged 55 points per game to win the gold and claim her spot at the 2016 Paralympic Games. I think she'll be a contender for the gold medal. I've just seen this young team grow so much that I think we're pretty hopeful that we can do really good and I'm really excited to be able to go back to Rio. You can trust her to be there for you on the court and off the court, which I feel like is a great quality to have. I adore most about her is her heart, her calmness, and how she handles every experience in her life. A sister to a brother with Down syndrome and having an impairment herself Becca would like to retire next year to become a social worker and dedicate her time to helping children with disabilities. I like to tell people that do have disabilities and even like the kids mostly is that you can do anything that you set your mind to and don't set boundaries for yourself because anything could happen. I could never imagine that I would be able to travel the world like I do, but if you just try your hardest in whatever that is that you want to do. I mean, you can make anything happen. Best of luck to Becca and Team USA in this year's Paralympics. And now to our special guest, clinical psychologist from Freighter Hospital and the Medical College of Wisconsin, Dr. Michael D. Smith. Thank you for being with us, Michael. Thank you, Kerrick. Um, we have these two amazing athletes. Now, I'm trying to figure out mm -hmm. how it is that these two absolutely talented individuals keep excelling in both areas and how, how they actually overcome these obstacles on a regular basis. Well, you know, um, in psychology for the past 30 years, a lot of people have been interested in exactly that question. How do people overcome horrible situations or major illness or injury? And it's created this field of research called resilience. How do people become resilient in the face of major challenges? And so you find that people bring a number of characteristics to the table. The situation has some characteristics. And each problem itself is a little different. So people who are resilient are able to take advantage of those resources that they have and can learn in the situation they're in. Oh, mm -hmm. so these people, it's not a compensation thing. No. These people are actually born with this innate resilience? Some people have different personality traits that make resilience easier. 
For example, some people are more resilient in the face of stress. Some people tend to be you know, more type B, more relaxed than type A like me, more kind of go-getting and a little more impatient. So people who have that more relaxed attitude do a little bit better because they can sit back and look at positives. And so that aspect, the personality aspect, does kind of come with you from your parents. But a lot of times it is what you've learned and the people you have or you used to have in your life. So for example, someone like our second uh, video with the woman who had spina bifida, research shows that kids who grow up with a challenging condition, if they have some positive mentor in their life, do much, much better than people who don't. So that's one of the reasons why kids in schools who are experiencing a lot of challenges, who might have mental illness or who are juvenile delinquents, mm -hmm. they actually have mentors like the Big Brother Big Sister program who actually kind of put a wing over them and show them how to be positive. Whereas other people who, like our first video, Kevin, when he was hurt, he had family and friends and coaches to put their wings over him until he could get through that depression, that adjustment, and pick up his life on his own. Oh, that's, that's, that's awesome. That's mm -hmm. awesome to hear. So actually, they, they might be just as good at improv. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That, that's, that's very interesting. And, and I, I, was, I was touched by the story. Uh, she, she won six gold medals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she actually had feeling. Right. But she did not have con actual control of her legs. That's right. So uh, just judging by her actually being brought into this world with this, uh, this uh, type of situation where she has no control over it mm -hmm. and someone who actually has sight That's that right. actually loses it later. Um, as far by comparison, would you consider one more uh, easier to adapt? Is it easier to adapt to that type of situation? That's a very good question. Um, on Tuesdays, we have a discussion group for people who've experienced major spinal cord injuries, like um, acquired injuries like Kevin through an accident, and there are people who come with spina bifida or other congenital diseases that make them partially paralyzed. And they actually talk about that very question once in a while. And what the people in the group, this isn't me, the people who actually live these problems, say there are some differences. When you grow up with a condition, you kind of can train yourself up. It's not a shock. You deal with it over time. Whereas someone who's had an injury or disease causing a disability, it happens all at once. It's very overwhelming, and they tend to go through a big adjustment process for two or three years. Mm -hmm. But once you kind of go through that, they find, the people find, more in common than not. And one of the things that they have in common is someone who doesn't do an either-or approach. So people who are resilient will see problems and strengths, failures and successes, instead of problems or strengths. And so that adjustment process, whether you go through it sl slowly because you're kind of born with the disability or you have to go through it on the fly, improv, like you said, um, because they have an injury or a disease, they all have that in common when you adapt successfully. And the research tells us about 80% of people with a disability will adapt very successfully. And people like Kevin are in a special group of about 10 to 20% of people after they're badly injured who do even better than before. So they're called super adapters. And there's a lot of research going to not that kind of population. Like his family said, he was more focused. He was more achievement oriented. He was more resistant to stress. So you'll see about 10 to 20% of people with devastating injuries or diseases do even better than they did before. And so those type of people find a way to see the positives and the negatives. Because if you don't see the negatives, you're going to fall into the potholes of your disability. But if you see the positives and the negatives, then you're able to navigate successfully and move forward with your life. And that's what we try to do with our patients at Freighter is help them develop that kind of double, not double vision, but normal vision. It's not normal to go around just seeing out of one eye, right? Yeah. If you can see, you use both eyes. That is true. 
So you want to look at the whole picture, not just part of the picture. One thing I noticed about Kevin is, is that even in the beginning when he was talking about the things that he had done and, mm -hmm. and, and how he refused to let that stop him, right. he wasn't scared at all. He had absolutely no fear whatsoever when it came down. His mom asked him about it, no, you can't stop me. <laughs> I love that attitude about him. It's an important attitude and that's an aspect of resilience people can bring to the table or that they can learn. True indeed. Thank you, Doctor. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Uh, we want to thank Kevin Myers and Becca Murray for sharing their stories with us. And we want to thank our guest, Dr. Smith, for being with us also today. May you all have a great night.